Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the NCRA collaborative program with this Commission on Cancer. Being presented is Best Practices for the COC Operative Standards 5.3 through 5.6, and this is a web webinar created especially for ODS certified professionals. So at this time, I would like to introduce our moderator, Nadine Walker, who is the Senior Director of Professional Practice at NCRA. And thank you for joining us today. Take her away, Nadine. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Mary mentioned, my name is Nadine Walker. Uh, I'm the Senior Director of Professional Practice at NCRA. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome everyone for joining the webinar today. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Medeget Tashoni, who's the Chief of Breast Surgery and Director of Breast Health at the University of California at Los Angeles Health, and also the Chair of the Cancer Surgery Standards Program Education Committee. We also have Erin Ruder, who's the Senior Manager of Accreditation at the American College of Surgeons Cancer Programs. And we're also joined by Kim Rodriguez, who's the Manager of Cancer Data Systems and Cancer Program Accreditation at the Eisenhower Health Lucy Kersey Cancer Center. So we welcome our panelists and thank them. Today's objectives will help attendees understand the rationale, technical, and documentation requirements for the COC Operative Standards 5.3 through 5.6. They will also outline best practices for identification of eligible cases for the COC Operative Standards 5.3 through 5.6 and define best practices with implementation of those COC Operative Standards 5.3 to 5.6 to facilitate compliance. So on today's agenda, discussion will uh, cover COC Operative Standards overview and process case eligibility and compliance requirements, implementation best practices and resources, and then we'll have a Q&A panel session at the end. So again, thank you everyone. And now let's please welcome Dr. Medeget Tashomi, who will start with COC Operative Standards Overview and Process. Thank you so much, Nadine, and thank you everyone for this opportunity. Um, I am going to first start with just talking a little bit about the operative standards 5.3 to 5.6 and some of this may be a review so I apologize for that but just want to help set the stage. So as many of you know the reason or rationale behind even having the operative standards for cancer surgery is that for many years we've had clinical care guidelines which have helped us to inform our decision making for patients with cancer and have been associated with improved outcomes. And although surgery remains one of the most critical um, parts of treatment for curative therapy for solid cancers, until recently there were no um, technical standards which existed to help guide the uh, operation. And so the operative standards for cancer surgery are meant to define key critical elements of a cancer operation which are associated with improved oncologic outcomes. And uh, some of the other functions of the operative standards, which can be helpful, is that they can help streamline documentation, which helps to facilitate communication among the multidisciplinary team. Also, this can help expedite review for quality assurance purposes or for research, and it can help focus operative teaching for trainees. So certainly when these first rolled out, they uh, represented a huge opportunity for us to improve the care for our patients, but also a challenge. You know, this was the first time that surgery, the conduct of surgery, the technical aspects were being um, evaluated by the COC standards. And also, it, you know, many surgeons may have limited or no experience with the COC standards in general, and therefore also uh, little knowledge of the operative standards, especially when they were first introduced and rolled out. So as you can see here, these are the six um, COC operative standards, 5.3 to 5.8. Um, this webinar will not focus on 5.7 and 5.8, which are um, already rolled out and have already been uh, evaluated in site visits and are evaluated using the pathology uh, synoptic report. Instead, we wanted to focus on standards 5.3 to 5.6, um, sentinel lymph node biopsy for breast cancer, axillary dissection for breast cancer, wide local excision for melanoma, and colectomy for colon cancer. And all of these are going to be measured um, for compliance based on the operative report and specifically 
the critical elements in a synoptic format, which we'll review. So for compliance with the operative standards, um, there's two parts. First is fulfilling the technical requirements, which is done, of course, by the surgeon, and then um, reporting the relevant data items in a synoptic format. So um, the idea here is to do the surgery based on the operative standards, but also to capture the uh, critical elements and report them in a synoptic format. Um, and as I mentioned, this is um, it needs to be in the operative note uh, for these patients uh, for standards 5.3 to 5.6. So just to kind of quickly review them, the first is sentinel lymph node biopsy for breast cancer standard 5.3. This standard states that all sentinel nodes for breast cancer are identified using tracers or, palp or palpation removed and subjected to pathology analysis. And then, as I mentioned, the um, operative report must document this in a synoptic format. And you can see here are the critical elements and the response um, options. And so these really should be kind of word for word in the operative note. Um, and I think one thing that's important, which you know may not have always been um, clear initially, is that each element needs to have a response. So even if the response is not applicable, like a patient can't have you know upfront surgery and neoadjuvant um, treatment, so one of those two uh, is, is going to need to say NA. Um, or if, for example, you use a tracer, but um, you know you weren't able to identify the sentinel node that way, you know you can also offer an explanation. So uh, the idea is to have all the critical elements um, listed, a response listed for each one. Axillary lymph node dissection for breast cancer. The technical or operative standard is that the axillary lymph node dissection must remove the level one and two lymph nodes within the um, anatomic triangle of the axillary vein, chest wall, or serratus anterior, and latissimus dorsi muscle, and preserve the main nerves in the axilla. And then this needs to be recorded in a synoptic format, as you can see on the side here. The next is standard 5.5, wide local excision for primary cutaneous melanoma. So this um, requires that uh, the wide local excision include the skin and all the underlying subcutaneous tissue down to the fascia for invasive melanoma and um, just to the subcutaneous fat for in situ disease. And then the clinical margin width is selected based on the Breslow thickness, which you can see here. And then this needs to also be reported in a synoptic um, uh, format in the operative report of record, as you see on the side, the elements and the responses. And then lastly, 5.6, colon resection. This um, standard requires that the resection of the tumor-bearing bowel segment and complete lymphadenectomy is performed on block, meaning together, with the proximal vascular ligation at the origin of the primary feeding vessels. And um, as you can see here, uh, um, the critical elements are identified, the response options, and this is, needs to be in a synoptic format in the operative report. So just some frequently asked questions that have come up um, and just to clarify and give some just brief scenarios what you might encounter. So one thing is that curative intent must be indicated because the operative standards only apply to surgery that's being performed for curative intent, not for palliation or, you know, um, some other indication. So it's, you know, it's not, um, I guess, it's a little bit of a paradigm shift for us to list that in our operative reports, but that is important. So curative intent must be indicated, yes or no. Um, another one is if a patient is having bilateral axillary surgery, let's say they have bilateral breast cancer, then the COC elements in a synoptic format must be listed for both sides. So one for the right side, one for the left side. Another question that comes up is, um, if you first have, a, if you have a case where you first do a sentinel lymph node biopsy and then the biopsy results are positive and because of that you proceed to do an axillary dissection in the same operation, then we um, uh, would require the COC elements in a synoptic format for both operations for that patient. So it should have a sentinel node, you know, um, the critical elements for a sentinel node biopsy and then also for axillary dissection. Um, wide local excisions, uh, we do understand, can be performed by a variety of different um, uh, providers in different hospital systems. And so it, it's really more based on the operation performed rather than who's performing it, uh, if it's gonna be considered a possible case. Um, and then lastly, and this, is, this one can get a little confusing, so I'll just go through it slowly, but if you're 
performing a colectomy for colon cancer and there's two, you know, lesions or two sites of disease in um, one resection, then you only need to have one uh, report, um, uh, reporting of the COC elements in a synoptic format. But if you resect two separate pieces of colon um, to take out two separate cancers, then you should have a um, the COC elements documented for each of those resections. So really everything related to the operative standards is based on the operation performed, and that can be kind of a good guide um, as far as what to do. Okay, and the next one. So just briefly to review synoptic reporting, um, since this is new to many of us um, in surgery, so synoptic reporting are basically um, standardized data elements that are organized into a structured checklist or template like the critical elements we saw before. And then each element has a value that is filled in using a pre-specified format. And this helps to make sure that, you know, if I'm doing it versus someone else versus another person, that there's um, an interoperability of information. We're not leaving things out or forgetting something. You know, you're in a rush, rushing somewhere. So every, everything is able to be captured and it's standardized. And um, these uh, reports allow us to, sorry, collect, store, and easily retrieve information. And it's almost like just a way for us to communicate with each other in a clean format. Um, it, on the next slide, you can see that probably the best example of this, which many of you um, are already aware of, is the pathology synoptic reporting. So as you can see in this um, schematic, you know, with the narrative report, you have to like read, search, where is, you know, the information that you're looking for, it may or may not be there, the important information versus in the synoptic report, it's very clear, like, okay, what's my margin status? How big is the tumor? It's easy to find the information quickly. So that's the same kind of idea that um, the synoptic uh, operative standards reporting is getting at as well. And I do think, you know, just to clarify, you know, full synoptic operative reports are not required. Really what's required for compliance with the COC um, operative standards is to report those specific critical elements that we reviewed in a synoptic format. And it has to be within the operative report for that patient, not the brief op note or not a separate note or something like that in the patient's operative report. So it's reporting of the COC critical elements. Um, just quickly to just touch on the timeline, which we're already <laughs> in the thick of it. Um, so for standards 5.3 to 5.6, full implementation was um, required starting in January of last year, 2023. So the site visits that started this year in January have started to um, evaluate for these, uh, these uh, four operative standards in addition to the other two and seven operative reports for each standard will be reviewed. And the compliance levels are starting at 70% compliance for the first year and will increase to 80% in the following years. I mean, we know it's not gonna ever be 100% compliance and that's not what's really being asked for. It's just um, the majority, uh, vast majority of the cases. Um, there always are exceptions. And then each operation must meet mo both the technical and documentation requirement for the standard to be compliant. And as I mentioned, the COC specific elements and responses should be in a synoptic format. And here is just a schematic. You know, this operative standards rolled out four years ago in 2020. Um, for standard 5.3 to 5.6, there was just a lot of education and implementation planning in the past several years with um, implementation starting in January 1st of last year. And now this year, site visits are looking for 70% compliance and then in future years, 80% compliance. So that was just a brief review of the operative standards uh, 5.3 to 5.6. And now I'll turn it over to Erin um, to discuss case eligibility and compliance requirements. Hello, so um, I am going to talk to you a little bit about the logistics of the site visit process and how you kind of put together your list for preparation for the site visit. Um, so first up, the first thing I want to say um, is talk about the alternative compliance pathway for standard 5.3 through 5.6. I'm putting this first because I want to make sure that this is, is highlighted and, and is taken away from this webinar. So for programs that are um, being reviewed in 2024, um, we have 
added in an option for programs to utilize an alternative compliance pathway for standards 5.3 through 5.6. So those are the four operative standards that deal with the operative report. The two, 5.7 and 5.8, which deal with the pathology report, this does not apply to. So understanding that these are new standards, um, programs may conduct an internal audit and develop an action plan um, for any standards where they might be struggling with compliance. Um, and if this pathway is chosen, then um, the separate audits and action plans have to be done for each non-compliant standard. Although understanding that the um, some of the solutions might be the same across disease sites. So, you know, if it's an EMR issue, maybe that's the same for all four of your operative standards, even though it's um, not, uh, not specific to disease site, but just make sure that you're including that and having separate responses for each issue. So these audits and action plans do need to be documented in the cancer committee minutes, and they must be documented before your site reviewer selects your cases for review. Um, and how this like logistically works is that your site reviewer will still do the medical record review during that site visit. And um, if it does is below that 70% threshold for this year, then the site reviewer can then look at um, your internal audit and action plan and assign a deficiency deficient but resolved rating. So that means that there's, you know, officially an acknowledgement that the, the requirements weren't met, but you're not gonna be required to submit corrective action. The reason for that is, is that you've essentially already done what we expect for corrective action, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, again, this has only been approved right now for um, 2024 site visits, but we will evaluate 2025 and um, whether that's extended later this year, and we'll let you know as soon as that's been decided. Um, so I'll take a, a few steps back here and kind of go back to, um, you know, what the process is. So um, I want to highlight the site visit instructions as kind of like the source of truth. Everything you need to know about preparing for your site visit is included in this very helpful resource, which is linked within the resources section of the quality portal. Um, just the kind of high level overview of what this process looks like is that you in your program will start preparing your patient list. And I'll talk about how you can do that here in a few slides. Um, that list gets uploaded with your PRQ 60 days before the site visit. Um, and I would say like during this time, please make sure that you're working on identifying how those records are gonna be, those operative reports and pathology reports are gonna be provided to your site reviewer if you're doing this virtually. So um, the importance for that is, is that you do need to find a HIPAA compliant secure method to be able to share those records and how that is accomplished is gonna be different from each hospital. So you do need to talk to your own individual IT or risk management department and figure out the best mechanism for that. If you're doing it on site, that's a little bit easier and you don't have to worry about that as much. But if you are preparing to do a virtual site visit, just keep in mind that that might take you a while to figure out the um, kind of like IT solution for that. Uh, you will receive your selected cases from your site reviewer. They will have selected seven cases per standard as previously mentioned. And at that time, you should start preparing those cases. Um, one thing that you're gonna hear me reiterate over and over during this, this section is that if you find as you're preparing those cases that any of your cases are um, ineligible for the standard, I think the most common is when um, maybe the, the surgery was not done for curative intent because we know that that's difficult to filter um, when you're pulling these lists. Just please let your site reviewer know. They will then be able to select an alternative case that does fit the parameters and it is completely okay that if you to tell the site reviewer that. They're actually expecting you to let them know if they have selected a case that's not eligible for the standard. So um, definitely should be a, a conversation with your reviewer. Um, you will conduct the medical record review or rather your site reviewer will um, and document the results and they will document the results. And then during that site visit, um, there will be a meeting with um, the relevant physicians um, and interested parties about the results of that medical record review so that any kind of questions can be answered and, um, and any follow-up that can be done. So a very common question we get about the patient list and eligibility is um, whether the offsite surgery center or like physician's, office, physician's offices have to be included. I think this largely relates to like when um, a wide local, local excision is done in a physician's office. Um, so the short answer is if it's in part of your accreditation, then yes, it has to be included in your patient list. And um, the easiest way to tell that is that kind of the test of, you know, if there was a case solely seen in that surgery center or physician's office, would you submit that to the NCDB on behalf of your accredited program? 
even if they didn't receive care at your primary location? And if the answer is yes, then it would be considered part of your accreditation. Just a couple quick notes for networks. Um, the patient list does need to be provided for each facility within the network. And your site reviewer is gonna select seven cases per standard per facility um, for those facilities that do those surgeries. And then uh, once your reviewer does that review, they will calculate the numerator and denominator from the combined. So each uh, numerator and denominator are rolled up into a network parent um, compliance percentage, and then that's how the percentage is calculated for compliance. So the patient list. So this is, there's basically two pathways you can take. Um, one is if the, cat, the case has been abstracted, you are obviously able to pull that from your registry. And this um, on the screen is a list of items that are to be included in that patient list if it's coming from your registry. This should look very familiar um, for those that have been through the site visit process previously as it's the same requirements um, as the former 5.1, like the CAP protocol review. So same kind of structure um, and elements that are included. If the case has not been abstracted, then the list, the list can be streamlined a little bit. And really, we just need to have a HIPAA compliant method to internally identify the record for tracking purposes. So what that means is that, you know, you need to be able to, on your the hospital side, be able to tell, like, you know, patient one on the list correlates to Jane Doe um, in your record. So as long as you're able to track that, we don't really care how you identify it. it can be one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D, you know, whatever makes sense. Just as long as it's not um, a HIPAA identifier. We do need to also include the procedure or treatment performed and the pathologic diagnosis. Any chance I get, I love to throw a HIPAA reminder in here. So just please do not include any PHI in your patient list or in the quality portal. So that includes anything that you're uploading into the quality portal. And hopefully you all know this, but I think the one that um, maybe is not as well known is that we do include um, or consider treatment dates to be PHI. So please do not include those um, in any material submitted to the quality portal. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but you do need to identify a HIPAA secure video conference or file sharing function for um, the medical record review if it's being done virtually. Next slide. So we talked about what if you haven't abstracted your cases yet, like, and um, especially this is true for programs that are reviewed early in the calendar year. So we do have a, a couple of ways, alternative suggestions to identify cases, and we did just add these suggestions into the site visit instructions recently. So you can check out the no most recent version in the portal. But um, some of the, the common suggestions are searching ICD-10 codes or billing codes, wherever you're able to do that in your system. You can work with the operating room surgery scheduling system. And the my kind of go-to recommendation is usually like is the pathology tracking system or, or talking to your pathology department. They should be able to pull those um, procedures for you. Again, I've said this multiple times, but I really hope that we drive this point home. But if there is any um, cases that are ineligible for the standard um, that your site reviewer selects, please just let them know so that they can choose an alternative. So I put together a list of um, some potential issues with the patient list, kind of like a um, checklist of to um, avoid kind of some back and forth. Um, you know, there's always an opportunity to fix it if something's not quite right with the patient list. So that's never fear there, but um, for the most efficient um, process, it's it's good to make sure that you're not just including abstracted cases, um, making sure that you're including all patients, not just those in your registry. And then, um, you know, we have seen a couple of occasions where um, I think there's just a misunderstanding and there's only seven cases listed per operative standard. Um, and that is, you know, I think unlikely that that's gonna be what the, what the scenario is. Um, but if that's true, that's completely fine. And that's a conversation to just have with the site reviewer. But I think that's a little bit of a um, something to um, tip off to maybe look into a little bit closer. Um, when this, the list has a very small number of cases, despite a large analytic caseload in that disease site, that usually um, will warrant a, just maybe a couple of questions. Um, another thing we've seen is that sometimes like an internal audit documentation is provided. So the list includes like an identifier of whether they believe the case is compliant or not compliant, and that um, does not allow the site reviewer to kind of objectively randomly select the cases, so we have to kind of go back and redo the list. And then again, 
making sure that the reviewer knows when a case is not applicable. But again, these are not the end all be all. Like it might just, I'm just saying that the like reviewer might ask questions. So it's just good to kind of keep in mind these um, potential issues when you're putting together that, that patient list. And then last but not least, um, the corrective action process. So this is gonna look very similar to what we talked about for the alternative compliance pathway because it, that pathway is essentially just doing your corrective action early. So what if you do get a deficiency on this, any of those standards, five, three through five, eight, um, you will be required to do a random audit of 10 eligible pathology or operative reports, uh, whatever is applicable um, after the site review. Um, the, audit has to show compliance with the original threshold of compliance from the site reviewer. So for 2024 site visits, that'd be 70% for 5.3 through 5.6 or 80% for 5.7 and 5.8. And if complaint is not met at the audit, then a detailed action plan needs to be put together with including kind of timeframes and very specific um, steps for how you'll meet compliance in the future. And that has to be documented in your cancer committee minutes. So including the audit results and you have one year to resolve that standard and that's just submitted through your corrective action PRQ um, at the relevant time. So that is it for my portion. We'll turn this over to Kim um, to talk about best practices and resources. Hi everyone. So I'll be talking about some resources and some implementation practices you can follow uh, for the synoptic operative reports. So first I want to start with pointing out some resources. Um, you want to be sure that you're viewing the most current version of the COC standards. So I recommend going to the website and directly downloading the copy of the manual there and the change log as well. And make sure you're paying attention to the version that you're downloading. As you'll see in this um, screenshot, it says updated February 2024. So make sure re you're reviewing the most recent um, standards that are available. Also, I strongly recommend subscribing to the Cancer Program News um, information. It keeps you up to date. They send out emails about every two weeks. Um, so this is a really great way to stay on top of the changes that are being released. Next slide. Um, and then just to point out um, from the Cancer Program newsletter on March 21st, there were some updates that were released related to 5.3 through 5.8. Um, and that's with the compliance percentages that were required. And then it includes information about alternative pathways to um, maintain compliance. And next slide. Also, you can find these updates in your Q port. So when you log in, if you go into the general resources section, at the very bottom, it will highlight these standard updates that are being pointed out. And so you can see very nicely here how it lists out all the updates. Next slide. Um, Additionally, there's an Operative Standards Toolkit website that's full of resources for everyone. Um, and you can see here there's a FAQs, which will be your um, guide in order to uh, follow through with the compliance on each of these standards. There's quick reference guides. Um, there's really great visual abstracts, which I like to share with physicians and the ODS staff. Um, and there's some other items there that you can review. Next slide. And here is just a screenshot of the resources on the actual toolkit website. And you can see it's separated out by standard. So you can go and look at the exact thing that you need to look for related to that standard. Next slide. Um, some best practices um, that we've kind of collected and through experiences. First, you want to identify your cancer committee physician who will champion these standards and engage um, with these standards often. Ideally, it would be a surgeon that's impacted by these particular standards. Um, of course, sharing regular updates and standard news, is, news um, updates and resources with them. Um, whenever the CSSP um, requests feedback, making sure that you're participating in that feedback and meeting regularly to review compliance and opportunities for improvement. Additionally, identifying physicians that are impacted by um, these standards um, is really important. So running a list to find those physicians that you need to reach out to. Again, also sharing those updates with them, providing regular education, 
sharing their compliance with them individually, <clears throat> but also in a larger forum, such as Cancer Committee, any disease site teams that you may have, surgery section meetings, um, sharing that information really is an eye opener to everyone. And then um, meeting with them individually is also helpful. Next slide. Of course, um, performing your facility uh, review internally is a really great way so that you're not surprised when it comes to your actual site review. And then on the next slide, I have an example of an audit tool that I created. I know it's a little bit blurry, but when we can provide a better screenshot. <clears throat> it's basically uh, separated by each individual um, standard that's impacted. Um, and then um, as you're entering your cases, you can complete each section and then rate your compliance so you can have a tool um, to audit yourselves if you don't have a method at your facility to do that. And next slide. Um, so now is your turn to share, <clears throat> excuse me, your best practices. <clears throat> so in the chat, if you would type BP for best practice, um, and then say at your facility what method you utilize to maybe identify eligible cases or um, share compliance updates, that'd be really great um, so that we can get some conversation going on how other facilities are doing this. Thank you so much, Kim. Now we'll move into case discussions. All right, so case number one. During a recent faculty meeting, Dr. A states that they do not understand why a synoptic report is necessary for COC accreditation. Dr. A expresses frustration when after an audit of their operative notes, they are found not compliant with the standard. So now we'll have a poll to see how you believe that question should be handled. Which tool would you use to improve buy-in for Dr. A? So go ahead and participate in the poll right now. A few more seconds to allow everyone to participate in the poll. Okay, I, I see now that the poll showed that the large majority selected all of the above. And about 14% thought the operative standards, but the correct answer is all of the above. Thank you for participating. So we'll move to uh, an additional case study. So why local excision for primary cutaneous melanoma? You see the operation was performed with curative intent. You see the Breslow thickness is there and the clinical margin is shown to be 0.5 cms. And the depth of excision is full thickness down to the fascia. So this poll is asking, does this case meet the technical requirements for standard 5.5? Please select either yes or no. Okay, 65% of you believe yes, that it does meet the standard. So let's see what the actual answer is. It's non-compliant with the standard because of the Breslow thickness. And here's another case. So for an axillary lymph node dissection for breast cancer, the operation was performed with curative intent and the resection was performed within the boundaries of the axillary vein and the chest wall and nerves were identified and preserved during the dissection, but no level three lymph nodes were removed. Does this case meet the documentation for standard 5.4? 70% of you believe yes. And this case is compliant with meeting the standard. All of the core elements must be reported. Um, all core elements must be in a diagnostic parameter pair format. All of the uh, diagnostic elements must be listed on a separate line and all core elements must be listed together. So great job. So now we'll have the panel discussion. Uh, we'll allow a Q&A to happen, and I will do my best to try and pop out all of the questions. I see that there are a good number of them. So let me begin with a question that says, uh, and then any of the panelists, you all can come on camera at this time and answer um, as you see fit. Uh, the first question is, 
is the alternative compliance pathway for 2024 site visits only? Uh, so at this time, yes. So we just make those decisions on a case by case, or excuse me, a year by year basis. So it'll be evaluated by the COC accreditation committee for 2025 site visits very soon. So we will make that announcement as soon as it's official. Thank you, Erin. Another question. Some of our melanomas are resected in clinic and therefore no op report is available. Is it okay for the synoptic report to be in the regular EMR notes? Karen, what do you think? So I was going to defer they're to you. Saying that, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, they're saying that the, I guess it depends if it's being documented as a wide local excision, then it probably still will be um, captured. But um, what they're saying is that the procedure is being done in the clinic. So where should they put the synoptic elements? I mean, hopefully there's a procedure note and maybe it can be captured at least in the procedure note. Yeah, so at my facility, my um, medical dermatologist includes it in his procedure note. He does his in office and we just um, have to pull his reports with his name and then um, they're usually at the bottom of his note. Okay, thank you. I hope that answered the question, sorry. That was a good answer. Thank you, Dr. Tashoma. Another question, um, would the registry accession number be the identifier for the site survey? So if I'm understanding the question correctly, so the accession number can be in the patient list that's not considered PHI. And if you are pulling it from a registry, that is often how kind of like you and the site reviewer will speak about a case. They will say, you know, maybe use the last couple digits to identify a case. Um, and that's how they would like track it on their medical record or their their tracker as well. Um, it's not required. It can be any sort of identifier as long as you, the program, are able to kind of track it back to who that patient is. Thank you, Erin. For the corrective action process, is that one year to resolve the standard, a full calendar year, or a year from the date of the site visit? Thank you. It's a third option. So it's the date of the accreditation report. So whatever um, your accreditation report will have, not only the date of its issue, but it will have a corrective action due date on there as well. And it's just a year from whenever it's processed. Okay, thank you. For corrective action on 5.4, the axillary lymph node dissection, this is rarely done any longer and most programs won't have 10 cases in a year. What's required when there are less than 10 eligible cases per year? So um, you will just, so the corrective action period is a year. And so if you get to the end of that period and you will only have you know, a handful of cases that are eligible for the standard, just include that in your minutes and just do everything that you have. And your minutes should just indicate, you know, this is our total volume for this review period. Thank you. All right. So I see that there are a bunch of other questions. I'm going to try and make my way down. Uh, let's see. Is having the statement compliant or palliative resection mandatory in the synoptic report? If yes, where is this located so it may be shown to our physicians? Is it maybe um, a question about the curative intent? I believe um, so. The, for each of the uh, standards, I believe that the cure is if it was if the operation is being performed for curative intent, should be the first critical element listed. Um, so, I think if you go just honestly word for word, listing out those critical elements and giving an option in synoptic format for those responses, word for word, then you know, it should be able to be captured. Thank you, Dr. Tashoma. For standard 5.6, scope of standard states colon adenocarcinoma. Does adenocarcinoma need to be biopsy proven prior to curative resection? Let's say operation pre-op diagnosis is quote unquote cancer, but it has not been biopsy to confirm adenocarcinoma. I am, I am not 100% sure. Um, I, I don't know if Aaron or Kim has any thoughts on that. Or um, I mean, if, if the surgery was done to treat a cancer, to me, 
whether or not it was biopsy proven, because I think sometimes you can just tell by imaging that it is in fact cancer, then I think it would be included in the eligible cases. But I'm, again, I'm not 100% sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, here's another question. Given the high demand for experienced ODS certified registrars, do you consider it the responsibility of the cancer registry to monitor compliance of operative reports, which are in the remit of the surgical departments? Registries can provide the eligible cohort of patients and allow the surgical departments to review and monitor their own compliance. Do you agree or disagree? Thank you. I think it really depends on um, the bandwidth that your cancer registry has. It's not a required um, item for the registry to monitor. However, a lot of registrars do participate in the COC accreditation process. So oftentimes it does fall to the registry. I have heard of other facilities having residents um, that are specializing, you know, like the breast surgical residents will handle it or you know, the melanoma surgical residents will handle it. There are different ways to monitor it and different people who can be responsible for it, but it is important for you to educate those other folks who may be handling the compliance monitoring on um, the eligibility and the requirements that are there. Thank you. I mean, I, but I, the only thing I would add, I certainly would agree with that, is that, you know, the COC process is intended to be multidisciplinary, and this is a great way for some surgeon champions to kind of own some standards that are obviously directly related to their day-to-day -day work. And so I think best practice would be to kind of get, like, I, that's a great re recommendation to have, like, residents who are championing these things. Um, so I think it's just a really good opportunity to get some other people involved, because as this question mentioned, the registry has a lot of work to do. and um, this isn't necessarily kind of their day-to-day -day, um, operation. So no pun intended, but I agree with what Kim said. Thank you. Yeah, I would also, and also highlight the fact that maybe it, it sometimes may take a team. Um, and I think that, you know, although it's not required to do um, kind of informal audits in your own program, sometimes that can be really helpful. Like you know, to identify different patterns, like maybe a few surgeons who are new just haven't had as much experience with this yet. And so, you know, you might find, oh my gosh, we have these cases that are non-compliant, but it's just maybe a matter of like onboarding, you know? So I think that um, working as a team to kind of continually assess compliance is very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Tshoma. Another question, how often do you recommend facilities perform internal audits? Again, I think it's really uh, depending on your bandwidth. Um, some other facilities I've heard from, uh, they do it quarterly, um, you know, to coincide with their cancer committees. Um, sometimes they have their like, the chief of, you know, breast surgical oncology will be uh, responsible for performing those audits and reporting those. Um, results out to everybody. So it really just depends on what you feel comfortable with. And um, I know some facilities may have a super huge caseload. So doing 100% may not be realistic. So maybe doing 10% or 25%, you know, and then just determining how often you feel like it's feasible for your facility to perform those um, audits and then report those results. I, I think it could probably change over time too. So maybe as you're kind of launching these standards and maybe not as comfortable it's more often, but as you're kind of, it's becoming more regular and the surgeons are um, more on board, maybe you can kind of slow down as well. Thank you. Uh, another question. <laughs> okay, if axillary reverse mapping is performed, does that have any bearing on whether the case is eligible for Sentinel and or axillary operative standards? I think this is a great question, and it's one that came up um, uh, earlier as well. But at least I would say axillary reverse mapping, which is where you inject the um, dye usually in the web of fingers or in the um, subcutaneous fat in the upper arm. And basically, you're trying to look for the lymphatics that are draining the arm. Um, that would, I don't think, be a part of the standard. So even though dye, blue dye can be used and ICG and things like that, 
I think that falls outside of the standards. So standards are based only on the sentinel lymph node biopsy or the axillary lymph node dissection portion of the procedure, which for sentinel node biopsy, the dye is injected into the breast. And then we're looking to see the sentinel nodes going, you know, drainage from the breast to the axilla. So I think axillary um, reverse snapping is outside of the scope. It, that would be the procedure and it's not included in the operative standards. Thank you, Dr. Shoman. All right, this is a, a question and a comment. So I'll, I'll try and just get the question there. Any recommendations for surgeons who dictate operative reports and forget, forget to add the synoptic op reporting? They, I think they it go may be, to, oh, I'm sorry, sorry go ahead. They go on, no, you're fine. They go on to say, our facility created a template within the EMR, but not all surgeons use them or share them with others. Any recommendations for those types of surgeons? Sure, so I think that um, depending on the type of EMR that you may have, um, there may be different options. Um, I know we have a couple of surgeons who still like to dictate and um, we utilize Epic. So in Epic, there's actually a method where they can go into the note and click on dictating it. And then at the bottom, they can import the synoptic operative report section and then answer their questions manually that way. Um, so it's kind of like a partial dictation system to sort of wean them off of using the old fashioned system. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think there are other ways to when you're dictating, um, they just need to remember like, you know, OK, this is with their header section. They would have to say synoptic operative section. And then um, you would have to work with the transcription company. But you would say like, number one, yes number two, and you would have to remember what those elements are for each type of operation. Thank you, Kim. Does an alternative compliance pathway need to be completed each year of the accreditation cycle or once per cycle? So for right now, it's just approved for 2024 site visits. So um, I can't make any guarantees, but I assume that if we do approve it for next year, we will provide some kind of guidance on um, what needs to be done. My assumption is that if we approve it for 2025 site visits, there just needs to be one internal audit, but um, I can't say for certain until we officially discuss it and prove it, and we will let you know. Thank you, Erin. If a program is actively having trouble meeting compliance and are aware of that before the site visit, should we go ahead and acknowledge and create an action plan as to how we are working through the issues? Yes, definitely, because especially if, like I said, like for 2024 site visits, that can be used to get a deficient but resolved rating. And also is just a good best practice to you know, identify what the problems are so that you can kind of identify solutions to fix them. And um, again, as just kind of mentioned, I would not be surprised if that's an option for 2025 site visits. Can't say for certain right now, but like that is a very good proactive move um, so, and it also just allows you to have a, a candid conversation with your site reviewer and that site reviewer can offer you a lot of recommendations based on other things that they've seen. Um, and I think makes the experience a little bit more valuable. Thank you so much, Erin. Okay, I think I am going to allow this one last question. I know we're running up on time. If surgeons do an amended op report after internal audit findings, will that be in compliance? So the kind of rule of thumb is that amendments should only really be done if it's going to impact clinical care. Um, so that's kind of just what I will leave it at. I would say that they're like the, the hard and fast rule is if the amendment is done after your site reviewer selects a case, it will not be accepted, but um, otherwise, the amendment really should only be made if it's going to impact clinical care. Okay, thank you, Erin. So I think we are going to hold there for all of the questions that have come in. I, I will say that any questions that have been answered today or um, have not been answered will be summarized and posted on the CSSP toolkit. Uh, webpage, so be sure to check there uh, after today's session. 
And I think there is an additional slide. Yes, here's a uh, contact information for the Cancer Surgery Standards Program. If you have additional questions that you would like to have answered, please send them a message at cssp at facs.org. And also there are quick links to the Operative Standards Toolkit, uh, the COC 2020 Operative Standards and the Cancer Forum. You can find information on the Operative Standards in all of those places. Before we log off, um, do, can we share some of the best practices that came through? And we can also, yes. of course, share them over email. Um, sure. So one best practice is an EPIC. Uh, this person runs a report each Friday of next week's surgeries. And the list includes the, diagnos the diagnosis and the procedure. And for the eligible cases, the surgeons are sent messages to alert them. Uh, of the synoptic smart list that it will be needed for their op report. So the surgeons are alerted that uh, the synoptic smart list will be needed in their op report. So that's one best practice done uh, via EPIC. Another best practice is that as this person reviews their path reports for case finding, they update the surgical standard fields in the cancer registry. So they do their own internal alerting. Another best practice is we are not concurrent with our abstracting, but we reviewed cases and suspense to find resections for auditing purposes. Another best, thank you all so much too for sending in these best practices. Another best practice is we use user defined fields, so UDFs, in the cancer registry software to track all COC standards with same language and terminology, and it really helps with audits. One. Another best practice, we concurrently enter pathology and code operative section out concurrently. We have added specific user-defined fields to document whether or not synoptic operative reports was required and whether or not it was completely completed correctly. They monitor this quarterly and report it to their cancer committee. Another best practice, I review a list every week of path cases, then review each case op report that are 5.3 through 5.6 eligible and track compliance. Then I report this to our cancer liaison physician, our chief of surgery, the cancer committee, and email the surgeon directly letting them know they need to do an addendum. 5.6 is consistently not compliant, and 5.3 and 5.4 are 100% compliant. This takes a great deal of time on my part to document and track. Another best practice via EPIC is to run the EPIC OpNote report biweekly, and then contact the non-compliant physicians promptly uh, for their op standard refresher, and then provide a tip sheet for adding synoptic reporting to their op node. Excellent. And I think uh, we will save, or I'm sorry, the CSSP will save all of the best practices and uh, summarize them. And I imagine that they will end up on the CSSP toolkit. Yes, definitely. Okay. Great. And I think, let's see, we are at 259. So that is excellent. Again, thank you everyone for attending, for your interest in the operative standards and how to uh, become compliant. Again, thank you to Dr. Tashoma, uh, Aaron Ruder, and Kim Rodriguez for uh, presenting today. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you.